There we go. We'll begin the story in pre-Civil War Boston. Boston was a center of the anti-slavery movement. There was a black community in Boston. It was small, but it was very well organized. Uh, primarily was on four streets of the, uh, on the lower slope of Beacon Hill. It was composed of free blacks and those who had escaped bondage. Uh, the, the leaders of this community would often meet at 66 Phillips Street, and that was the home of Lewis Hayden. Hayden was born into slavery in Kentucky. He, with his wife and son, escaped to the north to freedom, and eventually wound up in Boston, where Lewis Hayden opened a very successful clothing store. He was a very... Uh, one of the leading businessmen in Boston, and he was a uh, very integral part of Boston's Underground Railroad Network. He would recruit many men for the 54th. Now, before the war, there were a few things that happened that were rather devastating for the black community. One was the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The, the Kansas-Nebraska Act essentially opened uh, the West to slavery. It had repealed the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which had set the southern border of Missouri, the parallel along that southern border, as the dividing line between the free states and the slave states, with the exception, of course, of Missouri. And it would allow slavery to spread to the west in the lands which were at that time part of the Louisiana Purchase. Another thing that was devastating was the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott had traveled with his owner in, in the north, and since the northern states were free, he sued for his freedom. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Dred Scott's, the Dred Scott decision was not in favor of Dred Scott because, as the Supreme Court said, blacks were not citizens, therefore Dred Scott had no course to sue in federal court. So things were not looking good. Uh, a lot of the, the black community was disheartened. Even... Uh, uh, Frederick Douglass began to investigate the possibility of a black colony in, uh, for blacks in uh, Haiti. He actually booked passage on a ship. But about 10 days before that ship was set to sail, Fort Sumter was fired on, April the 12th, 1861. Three days later, President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers to put down a rebellion. Not soon thereafter, 10 regiments, 10,000 men marched out of Boston, out of Massachusetts. There was not a single black man among them. Blacks had volunteered to fight, but they were turned away. Now, you think about the Civil War and the causes of the Civil War, and you can get into big uh, debate on the causes. As far as what was the root cause of the Civil War? In my humble opinion, it all comes down to one thing, and that was slavery. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the South was fighting to preserve slavery. It was their way of life. The Northern men, however, who had volunteered to fight, did not volunteer to abolish slavery. They volunteered to save the Union which is what President Lincoln, his main goal was to preserve the Union. Lincoln said that he would preserve the Union with slavery, he would preserve the Union without slavery. Paramount to him was to preserve the Union. Now, one common misconception is that the 54th was the first colored regiment. It was not. If you want to get technical about it, it was the first colored regiment raised in the northern states east of the Mississippi. 
because as you can see, these, all, all of these uh, regiments were formed in 1862. The 54th would not be formed until 1863. So the 54th, however, was, was uh, named, as you can see these, the Kansas, first Kansas colored Louisiana Native Guards, the first South Carolina. These eventually would become part of the USCT, the U United States Colored Troops. The Massachusetts regiments, the 54th and the 55th and the 5th Cavalry were allowed to keep their name designations of their state. So in 1863, on January the 1st, President Lincoln signed the Declaration of, Indepen uh, Declaration of Independence, the Emancipation Proclamation. And uh, Governor Andrew of Massachusetts went to Washington, got an appointment with, with uh, Edwin Stanton, who was the Secretary of War who happens to be from nearby Steubenville. Let me read part of that order for you. That Governor Andrew of Massachusetts is authorized until further notice, that's a key point there, to raise such number of volunteers, let me skip to the bottom, and may include persons of African descent organized into special corps. The only thing they would not agree to was that any regiment raised would have to be officered by white officers. They would not commission black soldiers to be officers. So Governor Andrew was anxious to get that regiment started because if you look at that phrase, until further notice, there was still a lot of resistance to arming uh, black soldiers and Andrew was afraid that, that the government might come back on this. So. He went to work. He, called, he wrote a letter to a man named Francis Shaw in Boston. Uh, and in that letter, he, he enclosed another letter and asked Mr. Shaw to forward that letter to his son, Robert. And in that letter, he would offer the colonelcy of the 54th to Robert Gould Shaw. In his letter to Francis Shaw, Andrew outlined what he was looking for in his officers. He said, I am desirous to have for its officers, particularly for its field officers, young men of military experience, of firm anti-slavery principles, ambitious, superior to a vulgar contempt for color, and having faith in the capacity of colored men for military service. Such officers must necessarily be gentlemen of the highest tone and honor, and I shall look for them in those circles of educated anti-slavery society. He will go on to tell Francis Shaw that he intended to offer the colonelcy to his son and the lieutenant colonelcy to Captain Penn Hallowell of the 20th Massachusetts Infantry. This is Shaw. Andrew wrote to him because he hoped that father would help influence the son's decision. So Shaw carried the letter personally to his son's camp in Virginia. He delivered it on February the 3rd. Young Shaw refused the appointment. But two days later, he reconsidered and accepted the colonelcy of the 54th, in part probably to please his parents, but especially to please his mother. So this is Shaw. Shaw was born in Boston. In 1837, he lived a life of luxury, a life of privilege, the best of everything. The family traveled to Europe. He went to the best schools in Germany and Switzerland. They came back to the United States, to Boston. He enrolled at Harvard College. Stayed there for three years, but he dropped out after his third year. Didn't know what to do with his life. As the Civil War started, he, en he enlisted in the 7th New York Infantry, which was referred to as the Darling 7th, because it was composed of all the high society types. That did not last long. The, the, the regiment folded, and he was commissioned as a captain in the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry. Served 18 months in, in Virginia and in Maryland, 
He was wounded at the Battle of Antietam in the cornfield. So he had his man. Shaw checked all the boxes, what Andrew was looking for. Now he had to start recruiting men. The black population of Massachusetts could not uh, support an entire regiment. So they hired some of the leading black abolitionists to become recruiters for the 54th. On the screen from left to right, John Rock, Martin Delaney, who was from Charlestown, Virginia, now West Virginia, and Frederick Douglass. Recruiting began in earnest. The first uh, man to receive a commission for the 54th was John Appleton. He set up a recruiting office in Boston, and he began to recruit. The men he recruited in that office would become Company A of the 54th. Companies B, C, and D were raised in much the same way. But they still had to expand their reach. So <clears throat> Governor Andrew appointed a committee to oversee the raising of, of troops for the 54th. One man of that committee did more than anybody else who were raising troops for the 54th, and that was George Luther Stearns. You may or may not have heard of, of George Stearns, but in the late 1850s, he was a member of the Secret Six. That was a group of six men who bankrolled the maniacal plans of a man named John Brown. He was an ardent abolitionist as well. So Stearns was so successful, he, raised a, he put up a line of recruiting posts from Boston all the way to St. Louis extremely successful in raising more than enough men to supply the 54th. So Shaw arrives in Boston on February the 15th. He arrived, he finds out that there's still a very strong prejudice against arming blacks, an even stronger one against the men who dared to command the black soldiers. He was told they would not fight, they would run at the first sign of the enemy, that their employment would prolong the war, that white soldiers would refuse to serve with them, went on and on and on. His officers that were commissioned of the 54th, Colonel again Shaw, his lieutenant colonel was Norwood P. Hallowell, known as Penn Hallowell. His lieutenant colonel was young, Hallowell's younger brother, Edward N. Hallowell, known as Ned and all the others. Now these men had to have not only moral courage because of the criticism they would receive, but physical courage as well. Because on May the 1st, the Confederate Congress would pass an act. And I'll read the part that's highlighted. Every white person being a commissioned officer or acting as such who during the present war shall command Negroes, skipping to the bottom there, if captured, will be put to death or otherwise punished at the discretion of the court. So they had a lot to overcome, but that only strengthened the resolve of those officers. So recruiting, began, again, had begun in earnest. The men who were recruited were sent to Camp Meggs, which was just outside of Boston in Reedville, Massachusetts. Recruits arrived every day with increased regularity. Every day there were people there to watch, especially on Sundays. It was the in thing to do, go to church and then let's go to Reedville and watch the black troops train. Well, Colonel Shaw only took him about a week, maybe 10 days, before he was greatly impressed by what he saw. In a letter to his father, he would write, there is not the least doubt that we shall leave the state with as good a regiment as any that has marched. And he would be right, obviously. Now on May the 11th, they had more recruits than they needed for the 54th. So they began with the extras, they began filling the 55th. Colonel Hallowell, Lieutenant Colonel Hallowell of the 54th 
was assigned to be the colonel of the 55th. That meant that, that his brother would move up from major to be the lieutenant colonel. Finally, by May 18th, they were ready for a dress review. Great day, clear and cloudless sky. Uh, people began to arrive early in the morning. Private carriages, extra trains were set up to bring everybody to Reedville to see the dress review. There were many prominent people there, including William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. At this dress review, the regiment was presented with its colors. Not long thereafter, they finally, finally received their orders. General David Hunter commanded the Department of the South, and he wanted the 54th sent to South Carolina. So on May the 28th, they, got, they, they went to the railroad station, got on cars, arrived at Boston about 9 o'clock that morning. Colonel Shaw marched his men in column through town, across Boston Common, across the reviewing stand. They ended up at Battery Wharf, where they boarded a steamer called the D-Mole, and by 4 o'clock, they were off for South Carolina. Finally, the 54th arrived at Port Royal, South Carolina, on June the 3rd, about 1 o'clock. Once there, Colonel Shaw reported to uh, General Hunter. Hunter ordered him to proceed to Beaufort and disembark at that point. That would be their assignment. So they went to Beaufort. There they remained for four days, and all they did was fatigue work. Manual labor, digging trenches, cutting wood, you name it. Shaw finally lobbied for active service. So General Hunter told him to report to Colonel Montgomery at St. Simons Island in Georgia. Now a little about uh, Colonel Montgomery. He was from Ohio. He was an ardent, ardent, ardent abolitionist. In Kansas, from 1856 to 1861, he was the leading figure in the Free State Party. He was very heavily involved in bleeding Kansas. He was a very close ally of a man named John Brown. The first assignment that the 54th had along with the South Carolina Regiment was Darien, Georgia. So they went on an expedition to Darien, went along the Georgia coast, entered the Altahama River, and proceeded towards the town of Darien. There were gunboats that were with them. As they moved up the river, the gunboats would shell houses, would shell uh, clumps of trees, anywhere where they thought Confederates might be found. They finally arrived at the dock. The town was deserted. So the troops formed in the town square, and the order was given by Colonel Montgomery to loot the town. Anything and everything that wasn't nailed down that they could use, they took. Uh, there was one soldier, who, a private, who came by. He had two chickens in one hand, and he had a rope in the other hand. And there was a cow attached to the end of that rope. So anything they could get, they did. Then, Colonel Shaw was absolutely, totally, thoroughly disgusted by the next order. Lieutenant, uh, Colonel Montgomery ordered that the town be burned. They hadn't been threatened. They hadn't been challenged. The town was empty. He was going to burn that town. So in a letter to his father, Shaw wrote, after the town was pretty thoroughly disemboweled, he said to me, I shall burn this town. He spoke in a very low tone and has quite a sweet smile when addressing you. I told him I did not want the responsibility of it, and he was only too happy to take it all on his own shoulders. The reason he gave for destroying Darien was that Southerners must be made to feel this was a real war and they were to be swept away by the hand of God. 
That night the fire was seen 15 miles away at St. Simon's. On June 30th, the 54th mustered for pay. And this was the recruiting bar broadside that had been up all over. Let me call your attention to this part of the broadside. The pay would be $13 a month. Now they find out that the pay is going to be $10 a month. And out of that $10, three would be withheld as a clothing allowance. So they were getting paid $7 a month, whereas the white troops were paid $13, and they did not have to pay a clothing allowance. So that didn't sit well with anybody. The men of the 54th, white officers included, refused all pay. They would continue to refuse all pay until over a year later. And during that whole time, they still served. And as you'll see, they served quite well. Finally, uh, the 54th received orders to move. They were headed for James Island. What the intent was, here's James Island. General Gilmore was in charge now. General Gilmore had taken command after General Hunter had been relieved. His goal was Morris Island. What he had to do, however, was draw Confederates away from that island. They needed to take Morris Island to be able to lay siege to Fort Sumter, to be able to lay siege to Charleston. So to draw men away, Gilmore had a two-pronged feint. He sent one group up the Stono River right here to cut a railroad bridge. He sent General Alfred Terry with his command, of which the 54th was a part, to James Island, hoping that Confederates would be drawn away from Morris. Well, the plan worked. The 54th got to James Island. They went inland about a mile and they camped. About a week later, on July the 16th, they would have their first fight. It was at Grimble's Landing, as the battle was known. They had woken up early by the sound of gunfire to their right and front. So they immediately formed in line and advanced to the sound of the guns. They got to the front. They stood in line, and it wasn't long until the Confederates emerged from the trees. The battle was on. They fought very gallantly. They stood their ground. They didn't run like people said they would. One thing you can notice here, this is the 10th South Carolina, uh, the 10th Connecticut, excuse me. The 10th Connecticut was about to be cut off. As the 54th retreated, they held off the advancing Confederates. They, did, they stood their ground and gave the, the Connecticut troops time to get out of there and not, be, not have their regiment destroyed. It also gave General Terry time to form his line of battle for the expected assault from the Confederates, which never came. The Confederates retreated immediately thereafter, and they never advanced again. So the 54th saved the 10th Connecticut. A correspondent from a paper called The Reflector would write, the boys of the 10th Connecticut could not help loving the men who saved them from destruction. I have been deeply affected at hearing this feeling expressed by officers and men of the Connecticut Regiment. And probably a thousand homes from Wyndham to Fairfield have in letters been told the story how the dark-skinned heroes fought the good fight and covered with their own brave hearts the retreat of brothers, sons, and fathers of Connecticut. They distinguished themselves there, and they would distinguish themselves even further in two days. That evening, as they were having supper, <coughs> Colonel Shaw and, and Lieutenant Colonel Hallowell were speaking, and Shaw 
asked him a question. He said, do you believe in premonitions? Because I do not believe that I will survive the next engagement. And he didn't know, obviously, at the time how right he was. The 54th losses in their first fight were 14 killed, 18 wounded, and 13 missing. Total of 45 casualties. <clears throat> that, late that evening, uh, the order was given to evacuate James Island. The 54th was headed for Morris Island. They would march through the night. It was raining. Rain and wool, cut, wool uniforms don't mix very well. It was very dark. The, the paths were very slippery and very narrow. At some places, only one or two people could advance at a time. They would eventually end up at Lighthouse Inlet, which is right here. There they would camp and await transportation to Morris Island. Finally, steamers came. They transported them to Morris Island, and the 54th landed on Morris Island at 5 o'clock in, in the afternoon on July the 18th. This was their objective, Fort Wagner. Not a typical fort as you would think a fort. It was made primarily of, of quartz sand, palmetto logs. Uh, as you can see, the sharpened spikes surrounded the fort. And inside those was a moat that would fill with water at, at high tide, even a little bit at low tide. If you look at, this is Fort Wagner from a different view, from a diagram. This is the back of Fort Wagner. It is uh, facing Charleston Harbor. You're not going to attack from there. The west side was bordered by Vincent's Creek. You're not going to attack from there. The right side was bordered by the Atlantic Ocean. You're not going to attack from there. The only way was a direct frontal assault, which those things don't usually go well. And the fort had a bomb shelter in it. <clears throat> when, strong, when, when Colonel Shaw got to, the, to Morris Island, he went to General Strong. Their General Strong told him that Fort Wagner would be stormed that evening. He knew that Colonel Shaw wanted to put his men next to white troops. So he asked him a question, basically. You may lead the column if you say yes. Your men, I know, are worn out, but do as you choose. They hadn't slept for two days. They had eaten very little. So he gave Shaw an out. There's no way Shaw was about to take that. His face brightened. He sent for a message to Colonel Hallowell to bring up the 54th. They were going to go in. They would be the leading unit. Shaw accompanied General Strong to the front. He saw one of his friends nearby. So Colonel Shaw went to him, there's a man named Edward Pierce, and he gave Pierce his letters and his papers in case he did not make it back from Wagner. The color, the color company, Company K, was ordered to unfurl the colors. The 54th was ready to move. Now the assaulting force, this really wasn't the assaulting force, it's from obviously the movie Glory. But in numbers, the 54th had 600 men. They also had 22 officers who would advance with the assault. General Strong went to address the troops. And he said, boys, I'm a Massachusetts man, and I know you will fight for the honor of the state. I am sorry you must go into the fight tired and hungry. But the men in the fort are tired, too. There are but 300 behind those walls, and they have been fighting all day. Do not fire a musket on the way up, but go in and bayonet them at their guns. They had their orders. There was only, thing, one, there was only one thing wrong with General Strong's estimation of the Confederate force. 
he was only off by about 1,400. There weren't 300 behind those walls, there were 1,700. Then Strong called out the color sergeant, pointed to him with his saber and said, if this man should fall, who will lift the flag and carry it on? Colonel Rashad was standing nearby, had a cigar, took a cigar out of his mouth and said, I will. And the men cheered and cheered and cheered. They were ready to go. So with Colonel Shaw leading the way, they advanced over three quarters of a mile of sand. Once they got about 200 yards away, about here, they began to take fire from, from the cannons at Wagner. But they pressed on. They closed ranks and they pressed on. They didn't run. One thing I want you to notice here is th this area right here. It's a very narrow area where the troops would have to march. So they would have to squeeze together. And even squeezing together, the troops on the right would be marching, or they were going on the double quick, they would be going through the Atlantic Ocean in water up to their knees. <clears throat> the commander at Wagner was a man named General William Tolliver. He had given his men orders. He knew there was going to be an assault coming. The fort had been bombarded all day. So when the assault came, each specific unit had a specific area of the fort to defend. The 31st North Carolina was supposed to defend the southeast bastion. That's right here. For some reason, they didn't show up. If they had and added their fire to the rest of the fire of the cannons, it's doubtful that anybody would have made it past that narrow area. Colonel Shaw led the regiment from front, from first to last. He climbed the sloping fr front wall. The wall sloped 30 feet up from the level of the beach. He got to the top, lifted his sword and said, forward 54th. Immediately thereafter, he was hit multiple times and killed instantly. At the same time, just before he had been killed, the color sergeant had been hit. So a nearby soldier threw his gun down. In a battle, he threw his gun down. And he grabbed that flag, carried it to the top, and planted it on the parapet. Now up to this point, the 54th had not fired a single shot. They had obeyed their orders to go at them with the bayonets. Now, gunfire broke out and all heck broke loose. It was intense hand-to-hand -hand combat. The 54th, the members of the 54th who reached the level of the parapet were too few in numbers to sustain the attack. They were simply outgunned and outnumbered. They were forced to retreat. The order to retreat came from Captain Louis Emilio. Just to give you an idea of the, the uh, devastation that occurred to the officer ranks, Captain Emilio was ninth in line to take command of the 54th. So the eight guys in front of him were either killed or wounded. So they retreated to a point about 700 yards away from Fort Wagner. Now just to give you an idea of all of that, we all know the president, vice president, and so on. The president, the first in line to succeed the president is the vice president, followed by the speaker of the house, and so on. How many of you know who the ninth in line is? Anybody? It's the secretary of agriculture. I had to look that one up myself. The uh, sixth Connecticut and the 48th New York would follow after the 54th. They would have a similar fate as the 54th did. Now, <clears throat> during the retreat, that same soldier who had 
planted the flag on a parapet, retrieved the colors. He carried them away. He had already been wounded. He was wounded twice more. He was losing lots of blood. He was helped from the field, but he refused to give up the flag. He wasn't giving it to anybody except someone from the 54th. Finally got back to the line of the 54th, where he gave the flag to Captain Emilio. In all that time that he had that flag, not once, not one single time did that flag touch the ground. That man was William Carney. This is William Carney a few months after the battle. You, what, one thing you'll note is that because of his injuries, he has to support himself with a cane that you can see in his right hand. He's also holding the flag that he brought off the field. And if you could look closely enough and see, that flag is stained with his blood. This is Sergeant Carney. He was promoted to sergeant after the battle some 35 years later. A little grayer, still looks good, but one thing you'll notice is that thing dangling from his jacket. I'm guessing you all know what that is. That's a Congressional Medal of Honor. His citation reads, when the color sergeant was shot down, this soldier grasped the flag, led the way to the parapet, and planted the colors thereon. When the troops fell back, he brought off the flag under a fierce fire in which he was twice severely wounded. William H. Carney is the first African American to ever be awarded the Medal of Honor. That's a name that everybody should know. Now what was the aftermath? What happened is you can see the Confederate casualties, 181 killed and wounded. Federals, 50, over 1,500, 111 officers. The 54th had 40, a rate, casualty rate of 46%. The 6th Connecticut who followed them had a rate of 26%. And the 48th New York, 58% casualty rate. Now what about Colonel Shaw? After the battle, his body was stripped, save for his undergarments, and he was buried in a common grave with his men. This was meant to be an insult burying a white officer with black troops. A, a few weeks later, there would be an, there was announced that there would be an effort made to find Colonel Shaw's body. His father found out about that, and he wrote to General Seymour, excuse me, to General uh, General uh, Oh, I can't forget his, I forget his name now. But anyway, he wrote to the, to, uh, the general and said he did not want his son's final resting place disturbed. He said there was no holier place for his son to lie than with the men that he served with and the men he loved. He still lies in the spot where he fell. His sword was recovered a few years later in 1865 in a house in Virginia. General Quincy Gilmore, excuse me. It was recovered and it was restored to Shaw's mother and father. The sword soon disappeared again and it was found recently within the last, I don't want to say six, six or seven years, it was discovered in an attic in, uh, by a brother and sister who were descendants of Shaw's sister, uh, Susanna. It was restored, given to the Massachusetts Historical Society, and this is the sword that Colonel Shaw carried in the assault on Wagner. Now there were some things written about them afterwards, too many to mention here, but one correspondent from the New York Herald wrote, I saw them fight at Wagner as none but splendid soldiers, splendidly officered, could fight, dashing through shot and shell, grape, canister and shrapnel, and showers of bullets. And when they got close enough, fight, fighting with clubbed muskets and retreating when they did retreat, by command, 
and with choice white troops for company. A Confederate officer who was present at Wagner would later write, the Negroes fought gallantly and were headed by as brave a colonel as ever lived. General Gilmore had learned his lesson. There's, he knew now that there was no way he could take Wagner by direct assault. So he settled into siege warfare. September 6th, the Confederates, under cover of darkness, abandoned the fort. The next day, Federals moved in and established siege operations against Sumter and against Charleston. There they would stay, the 54th included, until the end of January, 1864. They were soon assigned to part of General Truman Seymour's Florida campaign, and they were under the command of Colonel Montgomery. The reasons, I won't go through the, all the reasons to save some time here, but these were the reasons why they were intent on taking Florida. They quickly occupied Jacksonville, and on the morning of February 19th, they moved out along with the 1st North Carolina, the 54th, brought up the rear. They were not in front this time. The march continued the next day, April, uh, excuse me, uh, April the, excuse me, February the 20th, and early in the afternoon they stopped to rest. As they were resting, they heard the sound of guns at the front. So Colonel Hallowell, who had been command now of the 54th, ordered his troops to drop everything, save for their arms and their cartridge boxes, and they headed on the double quick to the sound of the guns. They got to, as they got to the front, they were passed by uh, troops going in the other direction that were retreating. They passed General Seymour, who said, you must go forward and save the Corps. So they got to the front, they established the line, they stood their ground, they fought, they would withdraw, they would turn around, establish the line, and fought again. Their action allowed time for everybody else to retreat without getting captured or killed. Again, they saved white troops. They got back to Jacksonville and stayed there until April the 17th. Then they returned to Morris Island on the days of between April 17th and 18th. They remained on duty there until November of 1864. They were sent on an expedition, as part of an expedition under Brigadier General John Hatch, uh, to cut the Charleston and Savannah Railroad at Granville. This was done in conjunction with and to support General Sherman's march on Savannah. They moved out on the, on the 29th, and they got lost. So... The next day, they found their way. They moved out again towards Granville and their, and their objective. They came upon a small rise, about 15 to 20 feet high, known as Honey Hill. Confederates had built earthworks there. They had entrenched. They had the high ground. Even though the Confederates were, were greatly outnumbered, they repulsed the federal troops, and the federal troops retreated and did not sustain or did not renew their attack. Finally, Charleston fell on February the 18th, 1865. The 54th was one of the first regiments selected to march into Charleston, where the war had started, uh, as an occupying force. There they remained until March the 12th. They were involved in a very minor altercation with Confederate troops, local home guards, and, and some Kentucky regulars at Boykin's Mill. Uh, the, the, the battle occurred on April the 18th, but by that time the war was essentially over. General Lee had surrendered. President Lincoln had been assassinated. This was one of the last battles, and First Lieutenant E.L. Stevens of the 54th was killed 
distinguishing him as the last federal officer to die during the war. 54th would remain on duty in South Carolina until August. They mustered out at Mount Pleasant, South Carolina on August the 20th, and they returned to Boston. Under great pomp and circumstance, they marched in along the same road that they had marched out to many, many cheers. Now, almost immediately afterwards, there was an effort undertaken to raise money for construction of a memorial to Colonel Shaw in the 54th. They raised money for years. They finally uh, selected a sculptor, a man named August, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Augustus Sh uh, Goulden. I'm not sure I'm not pronouncing that right. But it took the man 14 years to complete the monument. This is the dedication of the monument on May the 31st, 1897. Governor uh, Roger Walcott at the time, Governor of Massachusetts, and other state officers were, are being, in this picture, escorted to the dedication by surviving members of the 54th and 55th. And you see that flag back there? I bet you can't guess who's carrying it. William Carney. The, stat, the, the memorial was originally envisioned as, an equest, as a lone equestrian statue of Colonel Shaw. His family would hear nothing of that. They did not want him pictured, or they didn't want him depicted on the lone equestrian statue. They felt that he should be depicted, as you see a close-up, with his troops, just as he had died with his troops and had been buried with his troops. And this is the result sits, on, sits uh, in Boston across from the State House. Now one little side story before I finish. There was a woman who witnessed the battle at Wagner from a distance, obviously. She had been in, in camp with the 54th. During the war, she had done many things. She served as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. She served as a scout. She served as a raider and a commander. She served as a cook. It is said that she served Colonel Shaw his final meal that morning. She served as a nurse. As the men were brought back to field hospitals, she served as a nurse. She became known as the godmother of the 54th. This is her picture, and I'm sure you can recognize Harriet Tubman. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the movie Glory. In my opinion, one of the top three Civil War movies ever made, and I've seen a lot of them. Uh, and usually when you have a movie like this, they take a lot of liberties. Well, they didn't take quite as many, but there still were some. Uh, Colonel Shaw's superiors were accurately depicted, except there was a scene in the movie where he confronted Colonel Montgomery and General Charles Harker after the raid on Darien. Well, there's only one problem with that. General Harker was at nowhere near South Carolina during the war. He spent his time in Virginia. Uh, the men of the 54th were all fictional. There was no private trip as portrayed by Denzel Washington in his Oscar-winning performance. There was no Cabot Forbes. I believe Cabot Forbes was a combination of the two Hallowell brothers. There was no John Rollins as played by Morgan Freeman. There was a John Rollins, but he was General Grant's aide during the war. In the movie, the movie opens during the Battle of Antietam, and Colonel Shaw at that time was Captain Shaw of the 2nd Massachusetts Infantry. And they were fighting in the cornfield. But in the movie, there was one thing missing from that cornfield that they were fighting in. Corn. There was no corn. So that was one little mistake. And at, in the part of the movie where they assault Fort Wagner, the ocean is on their left, when in fact it would have been on their right. 
Other than that, uh, it was pretty accurate, everything else. Uh, you can say what you want about the 54th. You can watch the movie. You can read uh, the regimental history, which I've read is very, very good regimental history. There's a book that, that details all the letters of Colonel Shaw, which gives you an impact into what his thoughts were. But no matter what, how you look at it, there's only one conclusion you can make about the men of the 54th. They all became heroes. Thank you.